job. Uh, good job. We do that Olympic trivia every single day right here on the link. 726. Let's head into the KUAM News Zoom Room where we're just so humbled to have the DYA CPS Director Melanie Brennan on with us uh, this morning. Good morning, Melanie. Good morning. Good morning, Chris and Bree. Good morning. All right, let's just, I guess, get right into it. Uh, we haven't heard from, uh, it's, well, it's been a minute, and I'm pretty sure there are a bunch of updates. I know I tried to get you on last week, but you're working on a crisis uh, placement. Do you want to kind of just start there on, on just the status of, of uh, placing kids? And I know the work always continues with DY and CPS, right? You know, um, so that's the nature of protective services, right? Um, every day there's a crisis. Every day there's, you know, work to be done in terms of, placing children and in, in, in terms of, you know, getting families the services and the support they need to reunify families that, um, of course, we've taken or exerted custody over. Uh, yeah, placement is constantly an issue, but not so much just because there aren't enough foster homes, but because really our first um, priority is to really research and figure out if there's family available to watch the kids. That causes, you know, the least amount of harm. Um, there, we are not, you know, of the impression that we just go in, we see that there are issues and we remove them. We try and speak with the family. We try and uh, resolve these issues by placing children with grandparents, with aunts and uncles. That causes less trauma um, to the children. Uh, do you have a, a number offhand, uh, Melanie, uh, how many kids are waiting for placements with foster uh, homes or parents? Currently, there aren't any children waiting for foster placement. There are some children that are um, in a relative placement, maybe that the relatives are indicating that you know they're they're not able to provide, um, especially like in cases where there's multiple siblings involved. Um, that you know the families just don't have enough room. They're you know extra uh, mouths to feed, and so really trying to support these families as uh, we work out, you know, more permanent, um, uh, permanent plans. How about on the DYA side? Uh, what's the latest update on that? So in terms of children or youth in the youth correctional facility? Sure. Okay. So um, in the youth correctional facility, since the pandemic, we maintain our lowest numbers. Um, at the beginning in March of 2020, we had about 25 youth detained. We currently have less than a dozen. And that seems to be the steady um, number, less working with less than a dozen. And so as soon as a youth is admitted into the youth correctional facility, work, working at a transition plan to help them and support them as they leave um, the youth correctional facility. Uh, do you think that that's because uh, kids are just really behaving themselves lately, or is it because school hasn't kind of been in session? Because I know some do some of the referrals for DYA come from the school setting. So, like the child welfare system, the juvenile justice system also gets referrals from the schools, and um, we believe you know it's a mix. Um, what we've seen lately in the child welfare system, in terms of child abuse, neglect, um, and abuse reports is that um, we have been getting, you know, during the summer, we've been getting a steady amount of referrals. And what we're seeing lately is a number of them involve severe neglect, physical neglect of children. And so again, um, just because we uh, go out and we investigate a referral on uh, physical neglect doesn't necessarily mean that we're gonna remove children. Our purpose really is to help families, to support families. And so um, it's a lot of linkages to services, um, it's a lot of follow-up and visitations. That's what um, families need. Families certainly don't need us to be going in there and just removing children. They're act they actually need help. And so that's what our social workers do. They intervene and they, you know, and they assess what the families need. There was a story that uh, I believe we ran, I want to say it was a few weeks ago, and it was one of those uh, wellness checks where I think uh, police had responded to the apartment of uh, a woman and had found well there were flies rotting meat uh, i believe there's also uh, infestation uh, they didn't find any toys or books for the baby and they had found a woman allegedly hiding under the blanket with uh, i want to say it was a toddler um so you know we again we have seen a number of severe neglect cases i can't speak to that case right. specifically right but yeah, that's the reality. Um, there are several um, families, there are several individuals that have children that have um, mental health 
issues and we collaborate daily with Guam Behavioral Health and Wellness Center. Um, that's unfortunate, but but yeah, those there are those types of cases. We've been seeing a lot of them lately. Um, Melanie, do you have any updates on the implementation of these uh, bills that were recently signed uh, by the governor uh, that would uh, place relinquished newborns into public health approved adoptive homes, um, specifically allowing adoption agencies, which are identified by Child Protective Services, to place legally surrendered infants with adoptive families instead of foster homes? Do you have an update on it? So, um, Bill 10836 is now known as Public Law 36-39, and that is the, um, the the law that mandates that um, that Child Protective Services identify and work with adoption agencies. And of course, you know, the governor and the lieutenant governor, as well as the author of the bill, they were always concerned about um, improving, you know, uh, the system. And one of those improvements does include working with outside agencies that can probably assist us. Um, they deal with their own families, um, and they we we recognize that. Uh, that once we work with them, that we'll have an additional resource um, to work with other families that maybe aren't interested in fostering kids, but really do want long-term um, uh, permanency in terms of adoption. Uh, we have we are aware of one agency, Ohala, and they are a nonprofit adoption agency. Um, and so we are. I I have been speaking with uh, the assistant deputy. Uh, Attorney General Carol Hinkle, and she's in charge of the family division um, to figure out just, you know, what kind of guidance uh, she can provide in working with these families. But it will be, CPS will identify the adoption agencies, and we will ensure that the home studies, the same types of protocols that are in place that we currently work with when um, families call us and indicate that they are um, wanting to adopt a children. Mm -hmm. children. But, but at this point, there's only one adoption agency. I'm sorry, I, I can't really hear at, you. At this point, there's only one adoption agency, the one you mentioned, Ohala? Yes, and they are they are currently licensed mm -hmm. to uh, operate on time. But it happened pretty fast. I remember the last time we had you on, you were expressing uh, some concerns, because I know there were a lot of concerns with these laws when they were uh, in bill form. And then it w I, re I remember thinking, oh, wow, I, I actually might have wrote something up. And then the next day, it was passed by the legislature. Um, you know, that being said, are, are you, I mean, it's just, you have to work with it now because it's a law, but are you, uh, have you satisfied those concerns that you had shared with us? Well, actually, um, the, the senator who authored the bill had been working with the previous administrator, I believe since 2018, and is familiar with OHALA adoption. Remember, I just came on board um, the end of January, and so I wasn't privy to those discussions. So when I did voice my concerns, and also um, the deputy director of the Department of Public Health and Social Services, we were able to meet with the senator, and we were able to resolve some of the um, amb ambiguities, I guess, of the of the bill. And so I am satisfied. I am um, obviously I'm a public servant. I'm going to follow the mandate of the law, but I'm also going to follow it with the guidance of the attorney general's office. So uh, are you are you saying that these laws aren't fully implemented yet, pending guidance from the AG's office? Well, um, uh, I am working with uh, Carol Hinkle Sanchez, and um, she's in charge of the family division. Um, yes, th since the the bills were signed, I believe July twentieth, um, it gives us thirty days to actually meet with the safe haven um, repositories and to work with them to. Um, I guess provide them with the packets that um, the bill provides, I mean, the law provides. And so honestly, the second bill, I mean, I'm sorry, the second law, public law 3640, actually just enhances the Safe Haven Act. And you know, um, the intentions are, are uh, really good, and it does provide some guidance for the Safe Haven, um, just for Safe Haven receivers. And this, so Melanie, just because uh, I'm, I'm kind of fuzzy on this whole the Safe Haven thing. So if I'm a parent, or is it just for mothers? It's basically for mothers who are considering um, relinquishing their rights. Right. And so what happens is if a mother is considering this, she does not have to fear um, criminal prosecution. She can just um, deliver the baby safely or even call 911 
to say that I'm interested in relinquishing my, my child, my infant. Right. And so as of now, uh, outside of this new law that was just passed, what would the process be, uh, let's say, a month ago? If a mother uh, were to call 911 and relinquish their baby, what would happen to that child? So, so sometimes in situations, and I don't know if you're familiar with, you know, um, there was a case where a baby was uh, left and the mother did face criminal charges. So um, in this case, now with the law um, being enacted, this provides protection for the mom who really just cannot um, afford to take care of her child or for whatever reason just you know, wants to relinquish her rights. She is able to call um, 911 or go to a hospital or a fire station or any clinic and um, our community health center and you know just drop the baby off basically and say that I, you know I can't I cannot at this time care for the child or or you know do I you know I don't want to and it's okay and she won't be um, charged with any crime. And then so now with the implementation of this new law, what what changes? That changes. She won't be charged. Right. She won't be charged. And so also CPS has um, the ability after the baby is medically cleared to relinquish the baby to an adoption agency that has a list of prospective adoptive parents. So, so it changes. It, it adds it adds adoption agencies into the mix. So if the adoption um, agency So what it does it, it what it intends to do is it intends to like circumvent the foster care system so that babies don't languish in the system for too long. That that a baby is given to basically a forever home right away rather right. than staying in foster care and moving. So what would the process be if a mother has second thoughts after she's decided mm -hmm. to give up her baby cuz I mean we see that I've watched a couple documentaries on it. I mean, is it just once the adoption agency gets his baby, that's it? No. So, so there's a, there are provisions in the current law that say that um, there's a period, there's at least a one-year period where that baby is supervised and, and the transition um, is supervised by uh, social workers, by Child Protective Services. And so um, if mom changes her mind, there is still the ability, her, her rights are not terminated just because she decides to... Um, surrender her baby under the Safe Haven Act. But it um, it does, it's, it's an expedited process, but at the same time, um, mom can change her mind. Dad, you know, biological dad can say, you know, I don't agree to this. And so it, it, it becomes a court matter. So that's what changes is the, so before if you relinquish your baby, it would go, it would go into the foster care system and that's like, there's a wait and now it just goes. So to the adoption well, so, so our current our current system prior to um, the enactment of these laws was that we also again um, received calls from prospective adoptive parents you know expressing an interest to adopt not not so much wanting to foster and so we do have a current listing of about um, 11 interested adoptive applicants but there are no babies you know and so um, really children that are adoptable. We have several like sibling groups. We have some disabled children. But we don't really have, you know, in single infants available for adoption. So there are some children that are adoptable in the foster care system that really are looking for forever homes. And we're hoping that our work with nonprofit organizations like Ohala can also assist us in finding homes for these hard to place children. Older, older kids are also hard to, um, to adopt. So the process, I was just thinking if the mom changes her mind or uh, is the father, like the biological father, notified when the baby is uh, relinquished? So um, every home study, every prospective, um, there's a termination of parental rights. And so there is a whole assessment on, on the parents. If the mom wishes to divulge who the father is, if the father comes forward, then then yes, that is that is looked into as well as you know, like medical history, family history, so that we're able to properly inform um, prospective adoptive parents of you know what kind of issues they might encounter later. Uh, so it's definitely not as easy as let's say you know uh, a mom is having a mental health day and just feels overwhelmed and calls nine one one, relinquishes the baby, but then maybe in a week comes to her senses or whatnot she can't just get the baby back, right? And so, so even in the regular, yeah, even in, in the regular child protective services system, we see that 
occur quite often, more often than um, full-blown termination of parental rights, I've changed my mind. Typically, women who are considering adoption um, consider it early on in their pregnancy and make you know outside arrangements, and usually on Guam, it's with family or friends that they're aware of, so it doesn't even really come into the Child Protective Services system until the court requests that a home study be conducted. Uh, we had a comment. Uh, does the one-year uh, period require the adoption family to stay on Guam for follow-up? That's currently how it works, Chris. But you can always petition the court. Um, you know, if you're if, if like with military families, you can always petition the court to be monitored by an adoption agency off island. But typically, it's one year here. Okay. We good? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Well, thank Melanie. Anything in uh, closing? Because I know you're very busy, and I want to make sure we get everything out of you before. I just want to thank you guys for you know your patience. You're always asking me to come on, and it's honestly it's um, it's constant you know busyness, but it's it's good important work. And so I'm sorry that it took so long for me to get on. Don't worry about okay. it. Okay. Appreciate the info information. I just wanted to get you on to kind of clarify the process with these two new laws, so that. Uh, people know when they make that phone call how how much gravity it, it carries right and and the process that it triggers i mean even before these new laws were passed so yeah I, I thank and, and you i guess that. you know it's just important to note that um the intentions of both laws you know are, are very noble and are, are very good intentions and it's it's hoping to help you know um the overburdened foster care system as well as you know putting infants immediately into homes forever homes right, right. and so i guess that's you know the point that i wanted to get across i mean there's a saying about good intentions but uh, <laughs> i'll keep it to myself yeah and yeah. you know and, and i and again we work very closely with the attorney general's office to ensure that you know what we're doing that we're following the mandate of the law and that we're also providing the best care to these children thank you melanie thanks melanie okay, okay. have a great day you too uh there you go 743 tuesday august uh third